Anyone who saw Elliot Kipchoge break the historic two-hour marathon record at the Ineos 159 Challenge in October 2019 also saw something else, the very unique and distinctive footwear on Elliot's feet. At the time, that was the prototype for the Nike Alpha Fly running shoe. The pacemakers for Ineos 159, meanwhile, wore the Vaporfly Next Percents. They couldn't be missed. Bright pink shoes featuring carbon plates and springy midsole foam. And really off the back of Ineos 159, the topic of carbon fiber plated shoes has become an explosive issue amongst the sporting and in particular running community. So it was about time that we explored all things carbon plated soles in running shoes on an expert edition of the Physica Performance Show. And on today's episode, you will hear from return guests of the show, Simon Bartold, acclaimed sports podiatrist and footwear industry doyon, and his colleague, Paul Griffin, sports podiatrist of Bartold Clinical, as we take a deep dive into all things carbon fiber plates in running shoes. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. We do this across a range of different episodes, expert editions, featured performers, coaches' corners, and interest editions. And as you heard at the top of the show, this is a discussion today around all things carbon fiber technology in shoes and what the technology means to elite runners and everyday runners. Specifically on today's episode, we'll explore the chronology of the carbon plate innovation in shoes. We explore the mechanisms, the purported mechanisms by which this technology works. And you may be very surprised at what Simon and Paul share around the proposed mechanisms. We talk about the role of the plates in the shoes, the role of the foam, the geometry of the shoe, the role of placebo, and so much more. We talk about the evidence for and against the effect of these shoes on the running injury profile. We discuss who and how these shoes can be worn, other brands, what they're up to outside of Nike with their own carbon fiber plate technologies, world athletics rulings, advice to health practitioners, and we answer some questions from listeners that came forward ahead of this recording. So get ready on this deep dive into all things carbon fiber plate technology for running shoes with Simon Bartold and Paul Griffin. Well, this is a reunion of sorts with the uh, after the masterclass footwear episode, an expert edition that was so uh, hugely popular. Welcome back, Paul Griffin and Simon Bartold. Thank you, Brad. A real Thanks, pleasure Brad. to be back. Different to last time, and we had a wide ranging conversation around all things running shoe footwear. Today, we're going to take a deep dive on on this explosive topic uh, around carbon plates in shoes, uh, running shoes, and the technology. Uh, I don't think in my years of running, 25 years or so, I've ever seen so much talk about footwear. So I think uh, you both are so well positioned to hopefully uh, help develop a better understanding around what's happening and, and why and where this is going. So are we ready? Yeah, I think I think this is a minefield, Brad, so I might just go and make a cup of coffee and let Paul handle the whole thing. <laughs> oh, no, I was about to hand pass it to you. It's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute hospital pass as well. I, I, do, I do remember us talking about how um, – confusing the the maze uh the landscape of footwear is out there for the average punter and to go and buy a pair of shoes and i think since we spoke was uh, just over a year or a year ago exactly i think that that uh, that minefield as simon said or it's just become so much more complicated yeah it's really interesting i mean it's, it's been called the footwear war um and that 
that in itself is an interesting comment, but also, of course, people are throwing around these terms like, uh, you know, EPO for the foot, and uh, they're they're blatantly calling what well, let's let's put it on the table. They're calling Nike cheats with this footwear, and um, the argument's actually starting to heat up. It's becoming very entertaining, I think. Well, maybe let's start there. Uh, you mentioned Simon EPO for the feet, and you know, obviously, the world. I guess became aware of the technology in modern terms, and we'll backtrack on the chronology shortly. But with Elliot Kipchoge's uh, attempt at <clears throat> the sub two uh, several years ago in Monza, and uh, and then off the back of that, obviously Ineos one five nine in Vienna in twenty nine twenty nineteen, the successful sub two hour attempt with the progressive shoe, the Alpha Fly, and uh, you know, as I've heard you state, uh, Simon and, and Paul. You know, some of the conversation went towards, well, it must have been the shoes that helped Elliot Kipchoge run the sub two hours. Uh, so I think that's really spawned the idea that if you wear these shoes, there's such a big advantage that it's cheating. But let's go there now. Uh, what are your comments around around that? I've seen some of your recent tweets and social media outputs, and I know you both strongly disagree. Maybe I'll go first. Um... Yeah, I do strongly disagree, Brad. Um, and and I'm actually, you know, a little bit um, I'm tired, I guess, of some of the bleating um, about all this because, you know, I think that let, let's talk, let's talk about cheating first of all. Well, I think cheating by definition means that you have to be doing something in secret, um, and and there's no knowledge for the runner. Well, if we take that on board, um, the four the Vaporfly four percent first came. Um, to public view in 2016, um, actually at the Olympic trials, and they were prototypes, obviously, but that shoe was on the market and available for 2017, and all the iterations of the shoes, uh, including and up to the Alpha Fly, which got released uh, four days ago, have been available to the public for scrutiny, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, that means that uh, Nike are not cheating. I mean, they're not. The, the key issue here is they are not breaking the rules as set by what was the IAAF and is now World Athletics. A lot of people are saying, "Ah, yeah, but you know, Nike's in the pocket of World a- World Athletics." Uh, Seb co has been on their payroll for you know 20 years, and look, th- those things are true. But I think that's uh, I-, I think that's drawing a very long bow to think that there would be that sort of intervention or that sort of support for a company. The bottom line is. Every athletic footwear company in the world has the opportunity to innovate. They have the opportunity to experiment with materials. They have the opportunity to experiment with construction methods. And the bottom line is Nike's just done it better than anybody else, and they've got a huge head start. Um, Whether the other companies can catch up to them is... Uh, well, it remains to be seen. I, th- I think it's going to be ver- it's going to take many years. I think that's how far ahead Nike are at the moment. Yeah, as you say, uh, every company has the opportunity to innovate. Uh, in my 25 years in endurance sports, there has never been, uh, apart from the swimsuits, which everyone is obviously familiar with how that went. But innovation is just part of the game. Uh, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop with bikes. It doesn't stop with anything. Training techniques. So I'm, I'm certainly with you, uh, Simon. Paul, anything to add? Yeah, I, I concur with the sentiment that, um, you know, with the use of equipment, it is it, like a shoe is a strap-on effect. You can, you, if, if Nike claimed you can get four plus <coughs> percent out of strapping a piece of equipment on, on, a, on a foot, then that's pretty much moving a little bit away from the natural physiology of the athlete and their capabilities. And I think that that's probably where the argument lies is, is um, and that is the holy grail of, of a footwear innovator is to enhance athlete performance and, and reduce injury if possible. But there's, you know, the, but these guys have obviously um, hit the, hit the mark with improved performance. Um, but, but going back to where everyone's getting a little bit upset, I think they're, they're really pointing the finger at the wrong place. I think the regulators are the ones that, that need to, um, you know, come under, under a little bit more pressure here. And, and regulators, as we know, are reactive. Uh, you know, you can't regulate until you, until you find out what you need to regulate. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if we, we see that landscape shifting pretty quickly over the next uh, 12 months. I, I, just don't, I just don't understand why people are saying that, you know, within a broad 
the canvas why it needs to be regulated. So we, we now have shoes that, you know, they have large stacks, et cetera, et cetera, and that's nothing new. They've got carbon plates, that's nothing new. But, you know, years and years ago, I was involved in an organisation called Olympic Solidarity. And Olympic Solidarity's sole purpose is to try to ensure that there's a level playing field for all athletes who compete in the Olympic Games. I'm here to tell you that ain't never going to happen. If you think the bloke who's riding a push bike from, um, uh, from Nigeria is using it has the same uh, material has the same equipment advantage as a bloke who's a professional rider from the usa then you're dreaming it just doesn't happen and it happens at every aspect of every sport um pretty much you can think of there were there will be a variation in the equipment that that they use and that uh, that's not the manufacturer's fault that's just a fact of life you know and the, the the issue i have is that we're all embedded in footwear, you know, Paul, you and I, we're involved at the very pointy end of it. And um, you can't innovate unless you have ideas and you can't move forward unless you take those ideas to production. So I think, I, I, I agree with you. I think that, that World Athletics does have a responsibility, but they've drawn the line in the sand to a certain degree based on some of the work from uh, Nick Tam that was published in uh, in BJSM. And uh, we've looked at stack heights, we've looked at uh, at geometry, we've looked at what the carbon plate is allowed to do. And I think, um, you know, that we, we have some pretty sensible information there now. Um, and I, I think people should just calm down and still realise that the shoe's only part of the equation. I mean, you can't, you, you can't, you can't be Elliot Kipchoge and just strap the shoe on and run under two hours for a marathon. You have to you have to look at every nuance of what is required to do that. And, of course, a huge part of that is his athleticism, his training, his diet, his sleep, his hydration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the shoe is maybe providing a fairly small but obviously very significant advantage. And at the end of the day, the equation is you can only, you can only achieve so much with a training effect. And then to improve, you've only got two choices, and that either relates to equipment or you can ingest something illegal that will help you. And that's the only way you can improve it. So in this instance, you know, we're talking about the equipment as providing, it's maybe just that that thing that gives the tiny, the tiny percentage that's required. I mean, we're talking about 0.51% of an improvement if 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 you achieve that and you're a runner in Rio and you achieved a 0.51% improvement and you're in the top five in Rio, you would be bringing home the bacon in Tokyo. You would be bringing home the gold medal if you achieved that amount of improvement. It's not very much. Simon, where does that 0.51% uh, statistic come from? Uh, the actual paper? Yeah, the source. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, or is that just an arbitrary figure that you've just, you know, thrown out as an no, example? No, no, that's, no, no, that's, that's actually just, just recently from Owen Beck's paper. Uh, it's a very interesting read. So that's a, that's a real number. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not, it's not very much, is it? So it's, uh, you know, it's half a percent, basically. So it's not very much required to, at the very pointy end of an Olympic marathon, that's, that's the difference between these runners. And uh, in that paper you mentioned, Simon, what was the landscape for that? What were they looking at? And was that measured in time, obviously? So this is, a, I should put a rider here. So this is a paper that currently it has been published, but it's not peer-reviewed. But it's a very interesting paper from the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, um, and it's it's the paper that looked at adding carbon fiber plates to shoes um, and what it what it what effect it actually had on running economy and in fact it found it didn't have any effect on running economy so it's um it's very recent it was only published uh, a few days ago okay so we'll look out for that one and uh, if we can pop it up in the show notes let's uh, let's maybe explore the the chronology around this I listened in preparing for this to a conversation that you had, Simon, with uh, Professor Berno Nig, uh, an absolute doyen of the the world of uh, running footwear, and you commented that uh, 21 years ago, Adidas uh, had a carbon plate and, uh, and Berno was behind the production of that. So that might surprise a lot of people to know that this isn't just 2019, 2020 
technology, so to speak. No, look, I think I think the really interesting thing is that I, I remember having this discussion with Benno um, j- at the pre-Olympic conference in 1999, so just before Sydney 2000, and we were talking about this, and he said, yeah, we've built the shoe for Adidas. Um, it's going to have a carbon f- fibre plate in it, and we'll make runners run faster. And so that in itself is interesting. 21 years ago, they were working with those plates. But the really interesting thing is that Ben O'Neig then supervised a PhD student called Darren Stephanition, um, who continued the work on carbon fibre plates, and then Darren Stephanition supervised a guy called Gung, uh, called Gao Luo, and Gao Luo is one of the principal authors. He's employed by Nike now, and he's one of the principal authors um, on the original paper on the Vaporfly 4%. So there has been, it's very interesting because there's been this sort of uh, passing on of the baton from Benno to Darren to Gung Leo, who is now at the absolute pointy end of the development of this whole Vaporfly, 4%, Next Percent, Alpha Fly um, uh, behemoth that we're seeing moving through now. So uh, if I heard correctly, it's almost like pass the IP along. <laughs> From, uh, well, a lot yeah. of the uh, a lot of the DNA that we see in uh, the broader footwear today, uh, you know, you could attribute to Benno's work early on, and and Benno's also responsible for that, um, you know, the walking shoe brand called MBT, which had a had was one of the first sort of rocker bottoms that came about, and obviously didn't allow much flex in the in the strobel or the or the you know where the foot foot sits, so there was less flex in the metatarsophalangeal joints and a cons- conservation of energy in that way. So it was drawing on the use of a rocker bottom shoe and then we obviously saw the the uh the the hocker shoe uh present sort of circa 2009 10 um you know large uh flat base where the foot sits on and a rocker bottom and so you can sort of see these these influences from uh benno which were say 20 years ago i won't won't draw direct correlations there but you can certainly see that there is um there is some some dna or trends that were were foundations were, were started say 21 years ago yeah i think that's actually really interesting because we don't we, we don't really talk about the rocker effect very much at all so everybody's focused on the foam and the carbon fiber plate but all of these shoes have a substantial rocker and you know as we know that that rocker works in um uh, in confirmation of the, it's called the Ruina Gomez effect. So it's like the half bicycle wheel effect. It's like a, an effect of perpetual motion. It has a huge uh, influence on on the way people run and on running economy. But we have not. That's not really even been touched on. So it's a very interesting point you make there, Paul. I've, I've heard you reference Simon as well that people also forget the geometry of the shoe. If you look at a, uh, you know, a, a Vaporfly shoe, next percent. Uh, or even the Alpha Flies now, they're commercially available. Uh, they're not your standard looking running shoe. <laughs> they're very, the geometry of them. No, definitely not. And this is something that I've, you know, I've talked with Benno a lot over the past four years about geometry. And, and one of the th- key issues from that interview I did with him was he said to me that he he thought perhaps Nike actually didn't know how didn't know what the effect of the Vaporfly 4%, et cetera, was. He, he basically said to me, I reckon they've stumbled across this and what has happened is the stars have aligned. They've got the geometry right, they've got the construction right, they've got the foam right, and they've got the shape of the carbon fibre plate right, but more through good luck than good judgment. And I thought that was fascinating and I I, I suspect that might actually be right, you know. Um, I, I su- suspect it was just... Uh, it was just the way it all came together. What makes you suspect that? Because I think that the, the there's been no discussion in any academic forum about the actual effect. All it's actually said is uh, it's it's a four percent economic advantage. It, it in no way has it said how that's achieved. And even when you talk with some of the uh, the protagonists, you know, guys like Roger Cram and those guys, um, there's not. I, I don't think they're being secretive, but they're not. You know, they'll they'll brainstorm and say, well, it might be the foam or it might be the plate. You know, maybe 3% is the foam and 1% is the plate. We don't really know. Um, but they're not actually, um, they're not actually, um, I guess, proposing any other ideas. And I find that very interesting because there has to be an effect. There has to be a reason why that's happening. And you can't just say, well, it's energy return from the foam or it's the lever-like behavior of the carbon fiber plate. It's got to be more than that feels to me like it might be the orchestra effect you know uh, maybe they've got the uh, fifth beetle playing as well the extra 
the extra member of the band. Uh, so it just it just feels to me like it's not one thing. It's um, you know it's a combination. And even even if you got that combination of things and put them together in a shoe, it then has to be placed in the right frame uh, for it to be effective. And I I, I, I concur with Simon. I think it's um, yeah, it's a fantastic uh, execution of uh, of innovation, and it's something that Nike. Nike hang their hat on. They're, they're, they're market leaders in innovation, and uh, that's exactly what they've done. Uh, Simon, I think you said to me back in the, the prior episode, prior expert edition, that it's good to be cynical. So I might throw that back at you. And uh, <laughs> from, my, from my uninformed view, relatively uninformed, I'd be looking at it, it, it sort of how could they not understand the mechanisms? Um, you know, uh, could it be that they're just protecting their IP and not releasing that? Or could it truly be, as you said, Paul, that they've literally just stumbled on the uh, the jackpot with these different elements, the foam, the carbon fibre plate, the geometry coming together. Yeah, look, I, I think for sure that's possible. Um, you know, I think I think Nike are a company who have uh, an extraordinary research capability, so we shouldn't downplay that. I mean, you know, they have they have the best people in the best lab, basically. Um, so they would they would have a pretty good idea of, of what's going on. But I think what is entirely possible is that they did actually put the shoe together. And then had to sort of uh, retro engineer the effect. So they had to, I think they, they saw this extraordinary effect and everybody, including the Nike guys, as far as I understand, were blown away by what they saw. I mean, it was just so unusual. And that leads me to believe that they they did not say, right, we're going to use this geometry, we're going to use this curvature, we're going to use this foam, we're going to use this rocker. Uh, and we're going to put them all together and we're going to have a shoe that's got a 4% uh, economic advantage. I, I don't think that's what happened. Yeah, interesting. Let's talk, touch on the mechanisms from from both of you. Uh, you combine knowledge base on how you think it might um, be effective or producing some of these, these uh, reported changes and benefits. Uh, you know, let's start, start with the, the carbon fibre plate. I mean... My limited knowledge is that it does act as a, as a greater lever and potentially offers more propulsion uh, through lengthening out that the longitudinal arch. But can you guys speak to that? You know, if you were to inform a consumer on the proposed mechanisms of the plate, what would you say? So personally, from what I've read and people I've spoken to and, and lectures I've heard, um, it seems like the foam is probably worth about 3% and the plate's worth about 1% of that 4% advantage. And it seems like the plate is probably acting more in its ability to help the foam be exploited rather than any sort of lever effect. But again, no one's giving too much away on this. Um, There there are some question marks about the long-term effect of a carbon fiber plate. So obviously it has a fairly substantial effect at a joint level and particularly at the first metatarsophalangeal joint. And there would have to be some quiet concerns in the back of a few minds of biomechanists and clinicians about what the long-term effect of that might be. We, we simply don't know. Um, but you are changing, the, you are sub- significantly changing the, the power outputs at the first MPJ and the ankle joint. Um, the next question about the carbon fiber plate is, is is it to do with its geometry? Because what we do know about the plate in, in the Nike product is that it's um, it's not just curved in one plane. So it's, cur- it's curved in, in multiple planes. So it has perhaps an effect in optimizing propulsive power. Um, so that's also a possibility. But but Brad, to be honest, the bottom line here is nobody knows. Um, you know, the, the shoe the shoe's been cut apart. It's been you know it's been dissected, and, and everybody's got a pretty fair idea of what it looks like. But um, I, I don't think anybody for sure has got a real handle on on what it's doing. Paul, just before uh, you, you pop your comments, I just wanted to check with Simon there. You said changing power outputs of the ankle and. The metatarsal phalangeal joint are in, in common parlance. Let's call it the you know let's call it the big toe joint. Um, yep. What what how how do the power outputs change? So so if you so the plate is full length right, so it goes from the heel right through to the toes. So basically, um, as you as you put a carbon fiber plate in there, and depending on its stiffness, then you will affect the propulsive power at the big toe joint. So so what we understand is that there is there is probably 
a Darren Stephanishan's experiments were very interesting. So what he did is he looked at the time it took to run 20 metres and then he progressively stiffened the plate and he found sure enough that as you increase stiffness in the plate that you can you there's a there's a linear effect in terms of reducing the time it takes to run 20 meters so bingo we know it makes you run faster however there's a vanishing point at which the stiffness starts to have a negative effect so in other words it starts to reduce power output at the first mpj and you start to run a slower time so so there is an equation between the stiffness and the geometry of the plate and and how that's going to affect uh, the power you can generate at these specific joints. Does that make sense? Uh, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, two convers- there's two conversations there. There's power output and then there's uh, metabolic efficiency. So, you know, what when the, <clears throat> when the innovators were coming together and they're trying to work out what should we build here? And they've obviously, uh, their target was a performance, hot top end performance marathon shoe specifically, right? Then, I don't know, I have the feeling that they, they started with the foam and then the foam was just too unstable and they used the plate, their IP, which was obviously from from uh, bygone eras of, of stuff that came in and they used that that IP with the carbon plate as a, as a chassis for the foam. And then, I, I, you know, then there's, as I said, two discussions. There's power output, which is when anyone thinks of carbon plate, oh, we want to talk about power output. But, you know, I think that it's not not exclusive to that. It's the discussion surrounding what they were trying to achieve with the foam around the carbon. Yeah, I think that's important. I mean, it, it, that feeds in pretty nicely to... Uh, we, we saw something really interesting happen over the weekend, Brad, at the US Olympic marathon trials. And... Um, and this this is all about how you exploit the shoe and the properties of the shoe. And what what we saw in the men is that the first four places were all in um, in a, a variant of the Nike four um, percent uh, shoe. So they weren't all in the Alpha Fly, but they were either in the Alpha Fly or the next percent. In fact, however, in the women it was a totally different story. So what we saw in the women um, is that. The first shoe across the line was actually a Hoka shoe, which is really interesting. It was the Rocket X. The second shoe across the line was the uh, Sorconi Endorphin Pro. And the third shoe was the Nike shoe. That's really interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, the men's picture is quite clear. Um, The women's picture is completely different. And it may well be that we are talking about how you can exploit both the foam and the plate in the shoe and that feeds into a body weight and strength discussion that might be quite important in understanding how these shoes work. And I guess that, I mean, I did see those, uh, you know, the, those findings, you know, from the US trials and, and Bartold Clinical published a good you know, little infographic there from Runners World with the, you know, the, the total number of shoes worn by brand across the line, 408 Nike, 59 Brooks, 28 New Balance, and on it goes. Um, and, you know, I did think how interesting Nike have the, the front guys across the line, but the, the girls, the women, uh, other brands were represented. So I guess we definitely want to go there on how, you know, how the runner exploits the shoe, as you've termed it, Simon. And, and this throws into, you know, a lot of questions that came through. And I threw this up that we were going to be discussing these shoes in this shoe technology today. And that is how does a... a amateur or recreational runner uh you know how can this potentially help and or could it hinder versus elite runners so we definitely want to go there i think can i um can i jump in there and just um discuss well simon would probably know more about this but uh, it leads on to what he was saying with um with the topic of what they call responders and um you know on a on another or a good analogy is if you give uh, 100 people the same dose of paracetamol, uh, there'll be, you know, there'll be a parabola. There'll be a lot of uh, people that uh, respond well to that, and then there'll be the the shoulders of the parabola where people don't respond that well. And the reason why they might not respond that well is that they might have a larger body weight, or they might just not respond. It might just be that case. So, I think it's the same with the shoe. It just really depends as a case by case basis. You can't just go and strap on a pair of um, Alpha Flies and and get a you know four plus percent benefit out of it and, and then there's a, a whole heap of variables there as far as like you know like we still don't really know if someone wears this shoe a little bit smaller a little bit big what effect it has and so when you're talking about the 
the minute differences that and the the outcomes that people get from the shoot. Sorry to confuse it any further, but if you just go down to the shop and buy a pair of these shoes, it doesn't automatically suggest that you will get the benefit that some others do. Um, and so when you look at the women in the hocker, for example, you know, when I put those shoes up side by side, I see that the peak, uh, you know, where the, where the peak of the rocker is or the carbon plate, the hocker might be slightly further back, alpha fly slightly further forward. And then you're talking about delaying delaying forces and so on and so forth. And so it really has to marry up with the athlete's capabilities. And what do you think are the required capabilities to exploit these shoes? Well, oh, Simon? Strength. Yeah, so strength for sure. Um, you know, and this is this is where this is where the, the discussion for me has become a bit annoying because people are just saying, you know, there's one group saying uh, it's all down to the athlete, and the other group is saying it's all down to the shoe, and of course that's complete nonsense. So, Elliot Kipchoge, you know, he's he's run fifty one fifty nine forty. He's a uh, an incredible. I mean, he's probably the best marathon runner we've ever seen. Uh, Bb Bikila might. Uh, Ken and Issa Bikili might argue that, but, um, <laughs> but, 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 you know, this is, this is a guy who um, has, has looked at every nuance of what is required. And, and a part of that would have been Nike building him a shoe. So I don't believe for one moment that the shoe he wore in, uh, in the Ineos challenge was anything other than a prototype. We will never see that shoe. So the alpha fly that's commercially available is not what he would have worn in Vienna. So they would have, tuned that shoe to him. So what Paul's talking about is a dose effect. So you talk about paracetamol, you know, you need to match the dose to uh, to body weight, you need to match it to all sorts of other things, including, uh, I- including the effect you're trying to get. The same thing happens with footwear. There's a dose effect. So you are trying to actually figure out what is required for a specific athlete in terms of the dose of, call it what you want, lever, energy return, rocker, etc. You feed all those things into the biometric data that you've gathered from the athlete and, and all the other things that you know about him or her, and then you build the shoe accordingly. Now, that that is what prototypes are all about. And I can remember way back in the day, we, we built prototypes at ASICS for Leroy Bar- Burrell and all sorts of guys, and they were bespoke, designed specifically for that athlete for a single use only, never to be worn again. And I think if people are believing that the new ruling by World Athletics is going to stop prototypes being used in competition. I just don't see that how that's going to happen. I mean, what are they going to do? Are they going to have a band saw at the finish line of the Olympic marathon and saw the shoe apart <laughs> to make sure it complies? I can't see that happening. Uh, the, you'll never know. You'll yeah. never know. I, I did. Yeah, I did think that was a interesting, uh, you know, quirk on the uh, on the rulings, uh, and we want to go there, obviously, discussing the prototypes. But from the athlete being able to exploit the shoe strength. Uh, is required. You know, it's evident that the best performers, Bridget Koskai with a women's marathon record, you know, one or two days after the Ineos 159, uh, Elliot Kipchoge, obviously they're strong runners. As a physiotherapist, I, you know, it makes me think about kinetic chain contribution to propulsion. You know, we know that 50% of propulsion or thereabouts is coming from the plantar flexors, the soleus, the gastroc, flexor halicus longus. Uh, you know, and I, I wonder about the effect of this uh, this stiffness uh, at the foot and ankle uh, on the kinetic chain. Do you guys have any thoughts there, what it might be doing over the, the course of a marathon to the proximal musculature, the, the hips, the quads, uh, below the knee musculature? Yeah, well, it's, well, it's, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, we've talked a bit about Ben O'Neig and, and some of the work he did with MBT was uh, was actually looking at the effect of of the external foot stabilizers. So we're talking about all of those all of those main muscle groups, the triceps, surai, tib ant, tib post, those muscles. And he was able to demonstrate that that if you have a rocker on a shoe, you have a substantial stabilizing effect of those muscles on the foot. So that's pretty interesting. Um, and and it may well be that we have trivialized the effect of the rocker in these shoes um, because all of these shoes, all of them, the Endorphin Pro. The Carbon X, uh, all of the the Vaporfly variants, they all have a substantial rocker. So that that's one point that might be quite important. The other thing that's quite important is is this effect of fatigue. And you sent us some notes, Brad, and I had a good read of it. And you said, well, maybe maybe this is fatiguing those muscles more. I'd make an argument to say I think it's probably fatiguing them less, because the other suspicion that I have about this shoe is I think it's probably reducing input vibration or, or shifting it away from the resonance frequency that's so bad for the human body 
and it's probably requiring less muscle effort um, than more, which means you're less fatigued when you go over the finish line. And all you have to do is watch the video of Kipchoge going over the finish line, and he looks like he could run another marathon immediately. I mean, he's bouncing all over the place. If you want a reference point, have a look at uh, Ryan Hall, the great American marathoner, when he fin- crosses the finish line, he looks like he's about to die every si- <laughs> every single time he goes over the line. Elliot Kipchoge did not look that way. He looked that was the, the that was amazing. Like really, the the last couple of hundred meters of of that event, it really looked like he simply couldn't run faster. It wasn't that he wasn't fatigued. It's just that that was as fast as he could actually run. It was just, you know, it was, it was almost like he's fresh as a daisy. So Yeah, well, he's run seven, he's run 17 second 100-metre splits for 42 kilometres, so I don't know how much faster you can go. Yeah. But, but, you know, but just, uh, t- sorry, Paul? No, just touching on, on what Simon was suggesting as well, I, I, I concur. I think that uh, with the years of experience of seeing patients in the clinic with dynamic stabiliser-type injury, and uh, I, I just feel that, uh, you know they, they chew a lot of juice um, in in running, and I, I feel I feel that the shoe has the capabilities to create a stable platform upon propulsion. The only question I do have is some of the uh, you know triplanar moments, um, such as you know subtalar joint um, moments that that contribute to say that we're getting a few reports <laughs> of some some of the coaches talking about tibialis posterior distal attachment, and you wonder whether or not just them being that high off the ground and uh, and well that that particular athlete being susceptible to it then there may be an issue. You're listening to Simon Bartold and Paul Griffin of Bartold Clinical sharing around all things carbon fiber plated shoes on this an expert edition. Support for today's show comes from Physiocram. Physiocram is a topical massage cream containing natural plant-based ingredients ideal for the temporary relief of muscular aches and pains. If you're conscious of what you put on your body, you'll be happy to know that Physiocram does not contain parabens or hydroxybenzoates, and its non-greasy formula doesn't leave any sticky residue behind. Physiocram can be found Australia-wide at your local Coles, chemist, or health store, as well as via their online shop. They've offered listeners of the show 20% off the entire range simply by using the coupon code POGO, P-O-G-O. Jump over to physiocram.com.au, F-I-S-I-O-C-R-E-M.com.au, to redeem this special offer. Hurting Sucks and Physiocram have got your back. Support for today's show also comes, as always, from Support for Today's Show also comes from Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want to see everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio complete their rehabilitation, cross their physio finish line, and get back to the things that they so love to do. Our philosophy is simple. We do not wish to see you for a session more than what you require. We just want to ensure you cross your physio finish line. To find out more about Pogo Physio's award-winning services, including our one-hour initial appointments or our very popular online physiotherapy services, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. For now, let's jump back with the team from Bartold Clinical on all things carbon fibre plates in running shoes. So, I mean, so it's really too early to tell the effect. Uh, as a clinician, uh, I think there's been the elites have adopted and the, the pointy end of performance and performers have gone for it. The aspirational runner, the sub three hour marathon runner, that New York Times uh, piece that was published, which I thought threw up a fascinating, you know, and they looked at a million marathon finishes and half marathon uh, finishes across Strava results and uh, databases of the majors, the major marathons, and 41% of marathons under three hours were running the Nike, uh, the Nike uh, Vaporfly, uh, or Next Percents. So I found that fascinating. But I think it's so hard to, from a physiotherapy point of view, comment on the potential injury changes that may be, a, you know, going to happen from these, if at all, from from adopting these shoes. Because I think so far the subset of runners that have adopted them have been the strong runners, have been the conditioned runners, um, and the runners with that uh, that higher ability, if you like, in performance. So it's really interesting to see as this trickles down to um, you know novices and, and amateurs, 
what the effect may be. But I guess, as you, you both sent echo there, we just have to wait and see. I, I don't think the shoe was ever conceived or designed as a training shoe. So I think it would be... I'd be very wary about any patient I had who was using this shoe all the time. I mean, it, it is designed as a race shoe. Mm. Um, and I actually, I think it's unlikely there'll be many major issues with it if it's used for its correct effect. But, you know, it, it never is, is it? You know, like yeah. when the Nike Free came out, it was designed as a warm-up cool-down shoe. And, and, you know, two days later, it was being used as a marathon running shoe and people were wondering why they were getting injured. Yeah. So... It, it is horses for courses. You've got to you've got to use it for the correct application. I don't think it's designed as a everyday training shoe. It's like Paul said prior. There, it was uh, these are sporting equipment. It's a it's a it's a bit yeah. of sporting equipment. You've got to select your your equipment. Just before we move on to explore some of the questions that have come through, just the foam. You know, you mentioned there that uh, it could account for three percent of the uh, reported four percent advantage of wearing these shoes or, or adopting this technology so what how does the foam actually what are the, what's the mechanism there if you can speak to that at all i know we discussed the carbon fiber plate but what what actually might be happening um i think the foam the foam is probably um the the secret weapon um i think what they did is they had a look at the uh, at the added as boost material which is encapsulated tpu so thermoplastic polyurethane uh, and they 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 pioneered an encapsulation method and used it in a product called Boost, and that kind of blew all normal energy return numbers um, out of the water. What what Nike did, I think, is have a look at that and say, yeah, well, it ain't bad, but it's really heavy, and it is quite heavy. And so they used this material called PBAX, which probably should more more correctly be called PBA, which is about 20% lighter. And to give you an idea. Um, in in the in the alpha fly shoes the next percent four percent it returns almost 90 percent of energy 89 percent of energy the next nearest punter is 60 percent so it is a way way better energy returning material and it's 20 percent lighter and we know you know we know very well the importance of reducing weight in in any shoe but in particularly if you're running a marathon you know, we, we understand the effect is 1% energy saving for every 100 grams you reduce from a shoe. So um, I think the foam's terribly important personally. And so it can give that rebound effect. And uh, I heard in your conversation with Ben O'Nig there that uh, it has an effect potentially on shifting the impact peak. Is that right? Yeah, not the impact peak, the vibration peak. So <clears throat> we, Benno and I, we're quite radical. We don't think the impact peak's all important. And I think the research supports that, that um, I, don't, I don't think the vertical component of the grand reaction force is all that important at all, um, apart from maybe comfort factor. But what happens when you look at input vibration? So, so think of this, when you strike the ground, um, you generate a shock wave that goes through your, your whole body. Uh, and that shockwave is a vibration. And that vibration is attenuated by things like muscles in particular. Um, if you contract a muscle, it attenuates it better. If you, uh, if you don't, then it, it attenuates it less. Uh, vibration of viscera, of organs, all those things, um, um, they dissipate the, the, the impact input wave. The important thing about it is you've got to look at it in two parts. So the vibration wave has an amplitude and it has a frequency. Um, and you, you can you can affect it by either reducing the amplitude or shifting the frequency. One of the things we understand, Brad, and this is sort of starting to get a bit complicated here, but one of the things we understand is that every human tissue has a has a specific frequency of vibration. So I can tell you, for example, that the Achilles tendon vibrates between 10 and 30 hertz. We know that. If your shoe, the shoe you wear, just also happens to vibrate at between 10 and 30 hertz, you have something called resonance. And resonance is almost certain to injure you. So we have very good data saying that it will affect muscle, nerve, bone, um, and tendon. So the goal here with shoes is you've got to shift that resonance frequency either from zero to 10 or from 30 and above. Does that make sense? You can't be in the same zone as the resonance, as the, as the frequency uh, of the particular tissue. So, so that's I think that's probably a part of what is going on here that they've sort of managed to to understand that. When I was at Salomon, we had a we had a project there in the biomechanics lab, and we uh, we we mapped uh, 24 tissues in the human body from the Achilles tendon to the cervical spine, and we had a 
fairly good understanding of exactly what the uh, the frequency of reson- uh, frequency of vibration of those tissues was. So if you know if you know what that that frequency um, of vibration is, then you can tune the shoe. It's the ultimate goal. You know you can shift you can shift the way the shoe vibrates in relation to that tissue. So it's complex, quite complex science, but it's also pretty pretty easy to understand. Simon, do you remember? Um uh, just raising this just off uh, what I recalled, but uh, about a year ago we had a conversation about vibration versus uh, hemolysis. Uh, I wonder if there's a relationship with the shoe and that as well. So hemolysis being when the when the leg hits the ground and you get that vibration, you get red blood cells just being destroyed, exploding. And so over longer distance um, events, you've got less oxygen carrying capacity. And so, you know, if you if you have a, have a, a, like a, a, a massive shock absorber stuck to the bottom of your feet, then you get he- uh, less hemolysis and more oxygen carrying capacity. That's drawing a long bow, but there has been some studies done on that. Um, well, I think re- I think that was always the discussion about the you know the the initial Hoka shoes and how they got a foothold in the market. You know, they were they were adopted first by ultramarathon runners, and you know, ultramarathon runners running up to 160 k's per race. Uh, yeah, they're going to definitely get some hemolysis um, over the course of 160 k. So, was it the rocker and the large um, protective foam that allowed them to keep on going? We don't know, but it, you know, that seems intuitive. It seems common sense. And I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, another project for uh, for uh, research somewhere out there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's so interesting; it gets forgotten about, doesn't it? Certainly. Uh, Sure. I think we don't need to look any further for the energy return than the bouncy shoe challenged, which uh, Bartol Clinical <laughs> recently launched. So jump over to social and have a look at just how much energy is returned. It's an internet sensation, isn't it, Brad? <laughs> I, want, I, want to see a pair of, I want to see those yellow Crocs you wear, Brad. Just bounce them on the ground and see how high they yeah. go. I'm trying. I'm trying to trying to source my old pair of KT twenty sixes. I reckon they'd be okay. <laughs> my uh, my uh, first experience in these shoes was uh, in Malta at a Super League triathlon event, and I popped on uh, Aaron Royals uh, next percents and jogged around the transition area. And I it was a bit of a catalyst for me getting back in some running, uh, some competition running. I was like, gosh, I got to get to a marathon in these. I was astounded <laughs> at how much spring they had. Uh, it does actually. Someone raised this in a question that. Back in the 90s, Nike used these, uh, you know, the, the gels, uh, not the gels, uh, the air pockets, Nike Air, the air little cells. air cells. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. And I remember having those shoes. And, and, you know, and now we see that, I guess it's a variation of that in the, the recently available uh, Alpha Flies. So what's the, yeah. what's, the, what's the go behind these little air cells? It's pretty interesting, isn't it? I mean, uh, I, I'm old enough to actually remember the first those air, sh- air shoes. It was called a Nike Tailwind. There, there was always a problem with it because they used to blow out and people have sort of veer off the road and run into a tree. But uh, <laughs> um, I, I think it's – I'm fascinated to see this come <laughs> back into the, the four-foot componentry of the Alpha Fly. Um, and I think uh, it, it's – again, I, I need to get one of these shoes and cut it apart with a bandsaw to see how it's constructed because I think they've done something very interesting with that Alpha Fly four-foot – or there's two of them, the two Alpha Fly four-foot pods – with the with the little air pockets in them, and I I just need to have a look at it and try to figure out what they've done there. Expensive experiments, Simon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, Bartol Clinical has a massive budget. R and D. I remember speaking to um in 2015, I went to Hong Kong and did a workshop with a guy called Mike Freeton, who was basically uh, uh, Bowman's sidekick uh, with innovation when they said when Nike started. And Mike spent 35 years at Nike as uh, one of the a part of the original innovation kitchen and he was discussing the the how they came about the air cells and for, for a while there they filled it with a really poisonous gas and uh, and when they were popping it was releasing this really bad gas amongst uh, amongst the users so they quickly had to they had like a, a massive panic over a month or so to, to quickly innovate around it and uh, and get some uh, get some alternatives in place interesting story yes yeah, it's, it's so interesting uh, before we throw to these questions gents, uh, the effect of wearing them over, say, 5,000 metres, 5K through to 10K half marathon and, and the marathon is there. I think it may have, may have been one of uh, you gentlemen that mentioned there might be this cumulative effect of energy return. The longer it's worn, potentially the more it, it has an effect. So anything we could add there before we explore some questions from the listeners? Yeah, I, I, I definitely think it is more more focused at marathon distance and I think it is because... It's probably having an effect 
at a fatigue level um, as a result of many different factors. Um, you know, interestingly, we, we've talked so much about Nike, but but folks, there are actually other shoes on the market. And, um, you know, I had a chance to have a look at um, some New Balance product and they've got some very interesting shoes in the 5280 fuel cell range coming out, in particular the RC, which will be out in time for the Olympics. And these are shoes that are uh, designed for distances up to marathon, but I think they'll probably be quite effective uh, over shorter distances and possibly more effective over 5,000, 10,000 metres than, uh, than, than the, the, the Nike Vaporfly variants. So, and, it, you know, again, we, we didn't actually answer the question about how come the girls are winning in things like the Endorphin Pro and the, and the Carbon X and the men are winning in, in, in the other shoe. And, you know, I think it's, there's a lot of unanswered questions about the way all these shoes are working for me at the moment. And I'm going to be very interested to see what research is coming out in the next 12 months. So we don't have an answer on that. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think we do. Just a, a curious, curious minds. I think as a general general trend, we can say that that footwear segmentation is having a bit of a resurgence, not so much in how the lower limb functions, but in more so athlete proficiency. And what um, what exactly do they want to achieve with the equipment? Do they want to run a marathon? Do they want to run 1,500 metres? Do they want to run five kilometres three times a week? And so, you know, we're going to revisit this whole segmentation thing again, but in a different paradigm, I believe. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me that we see we see Bridget Costco go under the world record for women, so she's absolutely decimated Paula Radcliffe's world record, and yet in the in the U.S. Olympic trials we see the the, the three women who qualify for the Olympic trials, um, only one of them is wearing a Nike product, and first and second are not. So, th- yeah, that there are real un- unanswered questions there for me. So is it about body weight exploitation? Is it because Bridget was was running in a shoe that was specifically tuned for her? Um, you know, obviously we're never going to know because that's classified. But, uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of what-ifs here, I think. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, I think if anyone out there is, you know, is wondering and, and we're now speaking to the experts, you know, both yourselves with informed opinions, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that this is really early days in 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 the, the science world, the clinical world, I guess, understanding one the impact of these shoes, but two also the mechanisms. Yeah, and I, and I think you know we've discussed this before, Brad. But but one of the things that things that people who are listening to this podcast need to also understand is that um, you know the the Alpha Fly is all, already well obsolete. So you mm. know, Nike Nike will be working on product for. 2023, 20, 24, 25, and I have absolutely no doubt that they will be working on designs that are light years ahead of what we're seeing in the current market. Um, and and now they'll be working within those new WA rules. Um, so it's going to be, I think, the next couple of years, as, as Benno said, you know, it, this is the most interesting time in the history of running footwear to be involved because there's so much going on and there's so much potential, there's so much discussion, argument. <laughs> there's a lot happening, so uh, it's pretty interesting. In a, I mean, it makes me think, Simon, of, uh, you, know, as a rec- you know, as a runner, we didn't really go there as a poten- potential mechanism, but the placebo effect, I mean, uh, I know you spoke about that with Benno, uh, and it's hard to control for in, the, in the, the limited research that is already available on these technologies, but uh, how could you not run a PB <laughs> if you put these on and the herd men, t- you know, everyone else is running PB, so I'm going to run a PB too. Like, maybe that's enough. <laughs> it's uh... Oh, yeah. Oh, look, I think that's absolutely true. You know, I think if you're... As a physio, if you're treating somebody with with shoulder pain and they come and say, "Hey, Brad, my shoulder's sore. Um, what can I do?" and you say, oh, "It looks pretty bad. I don't know." Um, and you know, the second approach is, "Well, I'm going to I'm going to tape it and I'm going to do this and that." And you know, I think you're going to probably be 30% better in a week, which is the more likely to get an outcome. You know, and if you make a suggestion about where it's likely to go, you're more likely to get an outcome. And I think it's very unlikely that if you're told you're going to go 4% faster 
that there is not going to be some major psychological advantage in this. Um, the placebo effect is super interesting, and I think it will probably it will probably enter mainstream medicine sometime in the next ten years as uh, you know as a part of a treatment plan. So, so the next model we might see might be the placebo from. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good name. It's a good name, isn't it? <laughs> and I mean, obviously, we know that there's going to be a limited innovation now around mid cell thickness with World Athletics limiting that to I believe it was about forty millimeters. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting that one. It's um, you know that that conversation revolves around uh, something more, uh, something deeper to the business of footwear. I think that Nike would have committed themselves to to contractual arrangements with regards to factory and manufacturing, um, and you know for World Athletics Federation to turn around and say, "Hey guys, you, you know we're not doing this anymore." I think they, there would have been legal obligations left, right, and centre. And so it's like a jumbo jet turning. I think they're going to have to really slowly turn it around to ensure that um, normal business bit can be conducted to ensure that it will it won't affect too many parties that are that are sort of collateral. Yeah, yeah. I think what well, I think one of the one of the really interesting things about the the new um, the new rule. It's not actually a new rule. It's a, an addendum to the existing rules. Is that they actually put a major. They put a major escape clause in there where I don't know the exact wording. I'm actually trying to find it now on my computer, but my computer's very slow. But but it was a medical ruling, so it basically said, yeah, you know, you can't do X, Y, and Z. You can't you can't tamper with the plate, and you can't tamper with the the stack height um, unless there's a medical reason for it. Yeah. Bingo. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like it's like taking um, yeah, it's like that. taking salbutamol, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, hell yeah, I've got asthma. I need some of that. I need some of that stuff. Give it to me, quick, smart. Or thyroid medication. You know, so I'm just thinking, okay, well, I've got a medical condition, so make me whatever the hell you want. And I just I looked at that. Yeah, I looked at that and thought, that's <laughs> that's unbelievable that that's been actually put in there. But yeah. um, anyway, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but now the prototypes are out, and you can see that uh, uh, you know the 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 secret source. Uh, everyone's sort of starting to reverse engineer what's going on, and you can see some similar shoes popping up as to whether or not they ever get their their chance at fame. Will be will be uh, seen. We'll see that in the future, I guess. We are so excited to be bringing to you the first physical performance show live event. Coming Down Under in July 2020 is none other than the most popular guest of the show, the most downloaded episode to date, Dr. Stephen Seiler, father of all things polarized training. Dr. Seiler is an acclaimed sports scientist internationally, and he will be conducting a nine to five one day workshop titled Sustainable Training for Attainable Endurance Goals, Intensity Distribution, Interval Training, Periodization, and Monitoring. It will be a day comprising four sessions and a Q&A session as well. It'll be held at the Bond Institute of Health and Sport, truly a live event not to be missed. For now, let's jump back with Simon Bartold and Paul Griffin on this An Expert Edition. Gentlemen, uh, in in drawing this to a close, uh, just perusing the circa 30-odd questions uh, that listeners have uh, thrown up in different forums, I think we've covered most of it. However, there's probably one good final point uh, to discuss from from uh, Justin in Australia, who's on, an, incidentally, a, a massive running streak, uh, setting a world record. But um, Justin asks, is the carbon-plated shoe better suited to a faster athlete, e.g. sub-330 pace, mid-range athlete or a slower athlete? And does the way the foot strikes the ground affect the efficiency of the shoe technology? Uh, yes and yes, but I'll let, I'll let Paul have a crack at this because I know he's got some thoughts on it. Oh, um, well, firstly, congratulations to him on having a go at the, uh, the world record. That yeah. sounds interesting. I'd like to know more about that. Um, uh, the conversation is probably a little bit of a misnomer. It's not so much about the carbon plate as it is about everything around it. So to be sure that, the you know, will a carbon plate shoe um, be for someone who runs faster? Well, it really depends on a number of things. Um, uh, what was the first part of the question? Sorry, Brad, I missed that. Yeah, is... You know, I guess are these shoe technologies better suited to faster athletes or or slower uh, slower athletes? It's a- if it's about getting the most out of it, I would say that a more proficient athlete, someone that's really, really, uh, you know, rock hard and fit, would get the most out of it. But I, I, I would be really surprised if brands aren't starting to think about other ways to engineer things for slower athletes with the similar technology. 
Yeah, look, I think this is this is like the Formula One, uh, the Formula One laboratory, isn't it? Where what what companies do, and I guess I've got some experience in this, is is that you you tend to sort of build this type of shoe for the very pointy end of the field. So you're trying to engineer a shoe that is designed to make the fastest runners go faster, and then you'll get certain features of those shoes that will percolate through the range, um, you know, what we call inline, they'll go down through the range and, and other runners can use it. So it's exactly like Formula One with, um, you know, ABS and all these sorts of things that have found their way into into family cars. Uh, personally, I think that the, the variants of these carbon fibre plated shoes are designed mostly for um, faster runners. And and if I had to draw the cutoff, I'd say, yeah, you probably, if you're probably running it at, much below a three-hour marathon, you're probably not going to be able to exploit the effect of the shoe as well as as others might. It doesn't mean you shouldn't use it, but I don't think you'll get the same effect from the shoe that uh, that guys who are, are running faster will. Um, and now I've forgotten the second part of the question, but it was how does foot strike affect the uh, technology? Uh, that's oh, right. Take that's the, an important one. Take that, Griffin. No, look, only only that there. You know, to get the maximum effect out of a rocky, you really need to strike before the the uh, the peak. But uh, Simon, you, you elaborate on that. Before the fulcrum, basically. So yeah, you, sure. You, yeah. It, yeah. So if you look at the rocker as being like a half bicycle wheel, um, you, you don't get the full effect unless you unless you go the the full the full quarter circle or whatever you want to call it. So I guess what we're saying here, which is very controversial, is you will, you will get a better effect out of the shoe if you uh, have more of a bias towards a heel strike than a midfoot strike. Did you just uh, say heel strike, Simon? I, I'm, a, I'm a loud and proud oh, heel striker. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm coming out. There you I'm go. So, so this is the thing is on the forums and so on and so forth, uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about the shoe because it's got that little rubber piece up toward the forefoot. It sort of uh, indicates or, you know, people have that association that you must strike on the rubber bit, you know, because it's, uh, it's house design. But in effect, if you do, if you do hit the ground before the, before the fulcrum, uh, you get a, mac- a maximum effect out of the design of the shoe. So um, go out there and smack the heels on the ground as hard as you can. It's a mechanical effect that, you know, it, there, there, really, there really isn't much argument about it. So it, it's, it's how well do you want to exploit, exploit the shoe? If you want to exploit the full benefit of the shoe, then you probably do have to strike uh, proximally to the fulcrum of the rocker, which means near nearer your heel. I mean, uh, that's that's not really something that we should argue too much because it's just a mechanical effect. So you could potentially infer that the natural heel strikers that go into these shoes may get a better advantage. I don't I don't know that I can accept the term natural and heel striker in the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> How would you edit it? Because the nat- <laughs> but, but, but you're going back natural, to but... <laughs> you're probably going back to the to the responders aspects. Like those people that actually respond to the product better, they may well have a gait pattern that suits the shoe. And so that marries up as being uh, you know, uh, a, a, a match made in heaven. But, you know, those people that are out there that want to work on form and, and want to get the most out of their shoes, the evidence is pointing toward uh, having having the foot plant on the ground uh, before the peak of the rocker. Okay. Yeah, yeah and I don't, I don't think, I, don't, I just think we need to be clear here that we're not, we're not suggesting that, that if you want to get the best out of these particular shoes that you should be, you know, overtly heel striking. <laughs> we're talking about a variation of somewhere between the back of the shoe and the mid part of the shoe um, because that's, that's where you will get the maximum benefit um, because you, you have the full effect of not only the rock but probably the carbon fibre plate. So, yeah, yeah that's good I point. mean. And, good. and don't go out and make big changes yeah. either. Just, no, absolutely <laughs> it's not advice. It's it's, it's just essentially what the evidence is saying. And I still recall one of uh, your prior pieces of advice, gentlemen, which was turn right instead of uh, always going left. So, you know, let's not lose sight of the bigger picture, the making the main things the main things. And as you've said, Paul, before, you know, let's not forget these are just sporting equipment selection uh, items. So, gentlemen, in, in, in wrapping up today, is there one final thing that you would like to espouse to listeners around these technologies? Maybe if you had to boil everything down to a piece of advice uh, around these, what would it be? Oh, well, for me, I, I'd say, look, um, it's, it's I think, predominantly a racing shoe, so it's for race day. Um, mm. I, I think that you've just made the point about turning left instead of turning right. You know, mixing up the input signals is super important, so have a couple of, couple of pairs of shoes in your kit bag. Um, if you 
at all can go out and run a few trails, um, you know, once a week, um, get on different terrain, uh, different surface. These things are all incredibly important. Very, very your runs, you know, so do some tempo training. If you want to be a better runner, they're the things that make you a better runner. Uh, so I think mm. the, the shoes are just a very small piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And although we've spent an hour talking about these, you know, very interesting shoes, they're still just a fairly small piece of the puzzle. You still got to go in and do the hard work if you want to be a good runner, um, and that's true for everybody from you know the weekend warrior right through to the, the the super elites. So I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. Great. And Paul, one piece of advice around these technologies. Oh no, it's as as I think it's exactly the same mantra as, as we've touched on before. It's a piece of sporting equipment. Uh, you know, if you, if you're into buying sporting equipment and it matches your your terms of use, then go and get some and. And look, worst case scenario is you use them once and you stash them in the cupboard and 10 years later you pull them out and they're worth a couple of grand. There you go. Beautiful. <laughs> Only if they're signed by Elliot Kipchoge. <laughs> exactly. Or well, Simon Bartol. Yeah. Uh, you, you got him before me, mate. Was good. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, so appreciate your time uh, on a busy work day week. Uh, busy work week day. Uh, so thank you. And uh, there's lots going on for Bartold Clinical. Uh, you've recently launched the show, uh, sorry, the Shoeforia podcast which I absolutely love the name. So uh, we'll tag everything up in the show notes and uh, anything you want to point listeners towards? Uh, Well, the most important thing is we are now in uh, Mandarin, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian. Instant translation. For, She's a beauty. Explain. For for, for For the whole website, you can do instantaneous translation by clicking a button. Wow, that's amazing. There you go. Just in case you want to work on your mandarin or something. But the other, on, on the other, my final comments are, Brad, thanks for having us on. Really a uh, big fan of what you're doing, a big fan of the show, and it's an absolute pleasure to be uh, be able to speak to you. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. Terrific work you're doing, mate. Thank you, gentlemen. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show, and I trust you enjoyed the share-ins of Simon Bartold and Paul Griffin of Bartold Clinical on this so controversial and hotly discussed theme around carbon-plated running shoes. If you did, then please reach out, let Simon and Paul know what it was that you enjoyed or took away. You'll find the team of Bartold Clinical over at Bartold underscore clinical over on Instagram and readily over on their website, bartoldclinical.com. Don't forget to keep the podsies coming. That's a screenshot of the episode that you enjoyed and tagging in the show at Physical Performance Show on Instagram and myself at Brad underscore beer on all the socials as well. If you have further questions for Simon or Paul, then jump over to the Physical Performance Show Facebook page where you can leave your questions and we'll endeavor to get those answered after the episode has gone live. A massive thank you to everyone who sent questions through ahead of the recording. There were so many, not all of them were able to be answered, but thank you for sending them through all the same. Now, my top three learnings from this expert edition. Number one, it's not all about the carbon fiber plate. Rather, it appears to be that the foam confers the greatest advantage of the two. As Simon shared, 3% of the running economy advantage has been identified to come from the foam with just 1% coming from the carbon fiber plate. Learning number two, when it comes to this shoe technology, consideration also needs to be given to the geometry, the shape of the shoe, including the often overlooked rocker bottom effect of these shoes. Learning number three, these shoes are for racing, not necessarily training. The future is unknown when it comes to the injury profile, the potential risks of running in this type of footwear more than occasionally. So use them for their intended use, which is racing. A massive thanks to those leaving ratings and reviews for the show over on iTunes or from wherever it is that you enjoy the podcast from. Another huge thank you to the great team who make the show possible. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin, all things show administration, and Matthew Olding, all things show graphic design. Another massive thank you to our long-term show supporter and sponsor of today's episode, Physiocram. Don't forget to take advantage of their great offer over at physiocram.com.au with 20% off the entire range. Now, 
Coming up on next week's episode of The Physical Performance Show, we catch up with Australian half marathon record holder, Brett Robinson. Brett recently ran a blistering 59-57 at the Maragami Half Marathon in Japan, and we caught up to discuss Brett's highs, lows, and learnings of his running career to date. There's some fantastic stories, including forgetting his race bib at the 5,000 metre 2016 Rio Olympic Games final, blowing up in the New York 2019 marathon, running a very swift 210 marathon debut. And of course, as always, there's the great weekly physical challenge from Brett. So be tuning in next week to the Physical Performance Show. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.